Hi, I'm Anna, and if you're new here, welcome to my channel, where we explore folklore, mythology, myths, legends, and fairy tales every week. And if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. Today we're going to look into Icelandic Christmas folklore. Let's get started. As winter approaches, the days grow shorter, darker, and colder. The snow falls heavily, the lakes and rivers freeze over, and the stark beauty of the Icelandic environment is covered in a heavy white blanket of snow. With only a few hours of light each day, it's no wonder that Christmas tales from Iceland can get very dark indeed. Tales tell of a terrible troll family that pester the people of Iceland throughout the winter months, especially Christmas time. This family is made up of the matriarch, the terrible giantess, Grilla, and her husband, Lepuluti, as well as their sons, the Jólasveinanir, usually called the Yule Lads in English. And even their family pet plays a role, their cat, Jólakötturin, or the Yule Cat. The name Grilla for a giantess or troll is actually first mentioned in the Prose Edda, in the Skoldskopmål by Snorri Sturluson, but no other information or description of her is given. Her name is simply listed amongst other names or words for a female troll or giant. However, the name Grilla is very similar to a number of words in Old Norse, Norwegian, and Icelandic. One of these words is Gigr which is the name used to refer to a female Jotun or troll. It's also similar to Grilla, which can mean to howl or growl, which may be the origin of her name from the terrible noises that she makes. Grilla may also mean scary or horror. Her name could come from one of these, or perhaps even be a combination of many or all of these words. She was said to be the mother of the Yule Lads, or Christmas Lads, who take on the role of Santa Claus in Iceland. Old stories of Grilla tell that she was like a peasant or beggar woman that would go from house to house, asking for naughty children that she could take away with her. However, she was usually chased off or sometimes given food so that she would go away. She was said to live in a cottage or hut on the edge of town, but eventually she became such a nuisance that she became an outcast and people chased her out of town. And now she's said to live in a cave in the Dimmuborgir lava fields. She's said to live there to this day amongst the dark peaks and mounds in the middle of the lava fields. The name Dimuburgir translates to the dark castles or the dark cities. And the site is also sometimes said to be where the devil fell when he was cast out from heaven in Christian folklore. During winter time, in the darkness of night and the days, she's said to hunt for naughty children that she finds out in the darkness. She captures them and puts them in a great sack that she carries on her back, and she brings them home to her cave to have for dinner. Sometimes she may just eat one of them as a snack, but other times it's said that she boils a great pot of stew in her cauldron, which is her favourite dish to make. William Sayers mentions some old stories of Grilla in his article. And the first mention is from a Faroese poem that tells that Down comes Grilla from the outfields with forty tails, a bag on her back, a short sword or knife in each hand, coming to carve out the stomachs or eyes of children who cry for meat during Lent. 
He mentions that Father North, a female tailed animal figure, visited Icelandic farmhouses around Christmas to place badly behaved children in its sack. A costume from the 19th century is described as including a coat of seaweed with a rusty hook in each hand. In this poem, Grilla is described as having many tails, up to 40, and she's armed and dangerous, especially towards naughty children. Her husband, however, is thought to be a lazy oaf that lies about their cave all day and makes her do all the work. He's thought to be her third husband. What happened to her first and second, no one really knows. His name comes from the words leper, meaning rags, and luti, meaning oaf. Despite this, Lepoluti is known to be the Yule Lad's father. But who exactly are they? Unfortunately, during the 20th century, the portrayal of the Jólasveinanir, the Yule Lads, has been heavily influenced by Santa Claus, and they're often portrayed as merry men in red suits and hats. However, this was not always the case. In traditional legends, they're thought to be terrible trolls, with large, long claws, and some said that they had no toes or they had splits in their necks. Old tales tell that they're evil beings that swear and act rudely and crudely, and are abusive and unkind to children. There are many different names given to the Yule Lads, and over time there's been at least 70 different names associated with them. And no one really knows just how many there are. These days it's commonly believed that there are 13 Yule Lads. Each have different names and different behaviours, and it's said that in the 13 days leading up to Christmas, one of the Yule Lads will visit each household and perform a different task or even a prank or cause all sorts of mischief for the inhabitants of Iceland. Over these 13 days they also leave gifts for children in their shoes which they must leave on the windowsill in the evening. However, if the child was naughty it was said that they would leave a potato instead of a gift. It wasn't until the 1932 poem, Jolin Koma, or Christmas is Coming, by Johannes Ur Kutlum, that the 13 Yule Lads were properly established within Icelandic belief. It also cemented Grilla and the Yule Lads as being directly associated with Christmas time. The 13 best known Yule Lads were popularized by the poem and it describes each Yule Lad and their antics and origins surrounding Christmas. A translation of the poem goes as follows. Let me tell the story of the lads of few charms, who once upon a time used to visit our farms. Thirteen altogether, these gents in their prime, didn't want to irk people all at one time. They came from the mountains, as many of you know, in a long single file to the farmsteads below. Creeping up all stealth, they unlocked the door. The kitchen and the pantry they came a-looking for. Grilla was their mother. She gave them ogre milk, and the father, Lepoluti, a loathsome ill. They hid where they could, with a cunning look or sneer, ready with their pranks when people weren't near. They were called the Yuletide lads, at Yuletide they were due, and always came one by one, not ever two by two. And when they were seen, they weren't loath to roam, and play their tricks disturbing 
the peace of the home. The first of them was Sheepcoat Clod. He came stiff as wood, to prey upon the farmer's sheep as far as he could. He wished to suck the ewes, but it was no accident. He couldn't, he had stiff knees, not too convenient. The second was Gully Gawk, grey his head and mane. He snuck into the cow barn from his craggy ravine. Hiding in the stalls, he would steal the milk, while the milkmaid gave the cowherd a meaningful smile. Stubby was the third called, a stunted little man, who watched for every chance to whisk off a pear, and scurrying away with it, he scraped off the bits that stuck to the bottom and the brims his favourite. The fourth was Spoonlicker. Like Spindle, he was thin. He felt himself in clover when the cook wasn't in. Then stepping up, he grappled the stirring spoon with glee, holding it with both hands, for it was slippery. Hot Scraper, the fifth one, was a funny sort of chap. When kids were given scrapings, he'd come to the door and tap and they would rush to see if there really was a guest. And he hurried to the pot and had a scraping fest. Bowl liquor, the sixth one, was shockingly ill-bred. From underneath the bedsteads, he stuck his ugly head. And when the dogs were left to be licked by dog or cat, he snatched them for himself. He was sure good at that. The seventh was Dorslener, a sorry vulgar chap. When people in the twilight would take a little nap, he was happy as a lark with the havoc he could wreak, slamming doors and hearing the hinges on them squeak. Skirgobler the eighth was an awful stupid bloke he lambasted the skier top till the lid on it broke. Then he stood there gobbling. His greed was well known. Until about to burst, he would bleat, howl, and groan. The ninth was Sausage Swiper, a shifty pilferer. He climbed up to the rafters and raided food from there. Sitting on a crossbeam, in soot and in smoke, he fed himself on sausage, fit for gentle folk. The tenth was Window Peeper, a weird little twit, who stepped up to the window and stole a peek through it, and whatever was inside to which his eye was drawn, he most likely attempted to take later on. Eleventh was Door Sniffer, a doltish lad and gross. He never got a cold, yet had a huge sensitive nose. He caught the scent of lace, bred while leagues away still, and ran towards it weightless, as wind over dale and hill. Meat Hook, the twelfth one, his talent would display. As soon as he arrived, on Saint Thorlac's day, he snagged himself a morsel of meat of any sort, although his hook at times was a tiny bit short. The thirteenth was Candle Beggar. T'was cold, I believe, if he was not the last of the lot on Christmas Eve. He trailed after the little ones, who, like happy sprites, ran about the farm with their fine tallow lights. On Christmas night itself, so a wise man writes, the lads were all restrained and just stared at the lights. Then one by one they trotted off into the frost and snow. On twelfth night the last 
of the lads used to go. Their footprints in the highlands are a face now for love. The memories have all turned to image and song. But what would this terrible troll family be without a beloved family pet? The Yule Cat, or Yolokotadin, is the name given to a monstrous, terrible cat that belongs to the family. It was said that it would stalk Christmas nights and look for people that hadn't received new clothes for Christmas time and eat them. Much like Grilla hunting for naughty children. It's thought to look like a large native cat, a bit like a Norwegian forest cat, sometimes with darker fur and glowing yellow or red eyes. It's a huge creature thought to tower over most homes and buildings. It's thought that the legend of the Yule Cat may have come about later as a type of motivation or encouragement for people to finish their knitting and their textiles work before Christmas and before the coldest parts of the year. The tale of Grilla, the Yule Lat, and the Yule Cat were all used to encourage or scare children, and sometimes adults, into behaving and working hard during winter time, the darkest and most difficult time of the year, but also one that has filled with the light and merriment of Yuletide celebration. That was today's video on Icelandic Christmas folklore. Grilla and Lepeloti, the Yule Lads and the Yule Cat. I hope you enjoyed it. But for now, stay safe and I hope you have a wonderful beginning of the Christmas season. Bye! I'd like to take a moment to say a big thank you to the members of the channel as well as my patrons on Patreon for supporting my work. Folklore and fairy tales play such a big part in my life and I love being able to share them here with you. If you're interested in finding out more about channel membership, you can find all the information here or in the link in the video description. Or you can head over to my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description of this video or on my YouTube homepage. Thanks for watching and thanks again to the members of the channel and my patrons for your support. But for now, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.